Welcome to all of you for Sunday TFCC discussion. I'm going to wait just a minute to let people join in and check the volume and let me know if it's um, loud enough so you can hear me. I have a headset on today. Next time I will have a fancy system. Hi. Hi. Um, but I wanted to, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, the people that make this possible. Uh, Deanne is our uh, customer service extraordinaire. She um, uh, answers questions, uh, takes phone calls, um, ships out the wrist widget. She's in Indiana. And uh, Miley, who has been able to take what comes out of my mouth and put it up online and share this information. Jan, who's in uh, South Africa, he helped me with, uh, he helps me with research and designing and articulating an exercise program. And then, of course, my family, um, who all participate in the manufacturing of the wrist widget. Um, so I, I also wanted to clarify our mission and make sure everybody understands our mission. Um, the TFCC is really poorly understood in the, United, in, in the world, and there's a lot of information that we um, are gathering on better, so that we can better understand the owner side of the wrist. And, uh, uh, you know, there's um, a lot of people, seven... 8 billion people on the planet that don't have access to the specialists and the doctors that understand this. So I'm hoping to take a little bit of weight off of them and help people find their own way to healing their owner sided wrist pain. Will everybody let me know if you can hear me okay? I get an okay on whether or not you can hear me. All right. So what I wanted to go over is kind of the top seven things that I see um, that uh, present very differently um, that are uh, cause ulnar sided wrist pain. Oh, yay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> of course, the first one is just a, a standard TFCC tear. Um, that is really easy to... Uh, for me to identify, the TFCC is the only injury that affects weight-bearing tolerance and has an immediate and significant change when you put the wrist widget on or you tape the wrist. So if your normal weight-bearing is 100 pounds on an uninjured wrist and your weight-bearing tolerance on the injured wrist is 20 pounds and you put tape or the wrist widget on and you see an immediate change that's significant. In central tears, it will go to normal very quickly. So it'll go from 20 pounds to 100 pounds, actually about 90 pounds, very, very quickly. In peripheral tears, it's more progressive. So that's a really simple test. It's $10 for a non-digital scale. It's a test that I've been doing for 15 years. I can strongly state that the only injury that has those dynamics are the TFCC uh, ligaments. So that's... The first thing I do <clears throat> is measure weight-bearing tolerance on a non-digital scale with and without the wrist widget. In normal wrists, weight-bearing goes down when you do when you put the wrist widget on, so it would go from 100 to 85. So that that's normal, um, but only in the TFCC tear does that actually increase when you put the wrist widget on. All right, another thing that I see more often than not is flexor carpi ulnaris tendonitis. Now, the flexor carpi ulnaris tendonitis, um, it, 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 it is on the palm side. It's, not, it, it's, it's less here. It's just a little bit over and hurts here. And uh, th th those can cause a loss of weight-bearing tolerance because as you extend the elbow and stretch the wrist back, that FCU, flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, is, is put on strain. It's your primary wrist flexor. It is an important, strong muscle. And it's, uh, when it starts to bark, it's, it's really difficult to turn the flexor carpi ulnaris off. And so it doesn't really get any rest. If you splint it, you actually get more tension to the FCU because the wrist has to fight against the splint. Um, you can't, you just, it's difficult to rest it. So the flexor carpal nerves, what happens with the weight-bearing tolerance numbers is you'll get a decrease in the weight-bearing tolerance, but the pain presents more afterwards. So you do the weight-bearing test. Your weight-bearing is not 100%. It does hurt, 
It's not a sharp pain. It's more of a deep ache that happens a couple of hours after, and sometimes 10 minutes when it's really bad. It happens after, and it kind of lingers. It has an achy feel to it. It's usually worse at night and better in the morning. Um, and it, in, in really bad cases, it can extend all the way up to the origin of the elbow. We see this, I see this in weightlifters quite a bit. And there's a couple of reasons is uh, they're overloading their flexor. So they're exposing that wrist flexor to a higher force than it can tolerate. Or they're fatiguing that flexor and that flexor kind of breaks down. Um, what's really interesting is that over the um, long period of time that I've been practicing as a hand therapist, um, uh, 23 years or something, the flexor carpi um, ulnaris are the more difficult for me to treat because they, it, they just have a hard time resting. But the acupuncturist perspective says that, um, I'll, I'll talk about that, Nick Bedrin, in just a second. Um, the, the flexor carpi ulnaris will have um, a correlation to dehydration. So you see people with Mag uh, dehydration and the way you can test that is you can get a blood test which will define that and what I see is a low potassium low sodium or you can just do a really thorough rehydration program where you you um, take electrolytes all day every day for four days five days and see how that affects your symptoms there's a bunch of other stuff that we can do for flexor car carpi ulnaris. I will swing back if I have time. Um, I want to go over to the next one, which is the ECU. So again, I'm going to sum up the flexor carpi ulnaris as a small loss of weight-bearing tolerance, not a significant loss, a small loss of weight-bearing tolerance, and a de delayed um, pain ache in two hours after the weight-bearing test pain worse at night than in the morning um, and it's something that is hard to turn off so you'll get an achiness um, throughout the day versus a really sharp pain. Okay, ECU, sensor carpal neris, is something we see a lot and usually the underlying issue is a TFCC tear that then develops into an ECU and the, 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 if somebody has a significant TFCC tear and their weight bearing is under 45 pounds, you can almost always predict that the ECU is involved. And the reason that is, is because the spreading of the distal radius and ulna causes a change in the biomechanics of the ECU, and the ECU kind of starts to take on the load. The extensor carpi ulnaris is a small muscle. It's not a very strong muscle. It's an important muscle. But what happens is once the TFCC is disrupted, the ECU gets, uh, has a different angle of pull, starts to break down, and then sublux and flame up. But if you treat the, the TFCC, the ECU resolves. I've seen this over and over and over again. There's a lot of other um, things that can cause an ECU tendonitis, but primarily what I see is people with a primary TFCC and a secondary ECU tendonitis. Ah, the, with the FCU, the FCU can cause clicking in the wrist. Um, uh, uh, anytime there's a disruption of the balance of the wrist, you'll get clicking. And the bones won't align. Um, you'll, uh, with the FCU, I find that if you push up this way, it will cause a, 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 an alignment of the wrist. And that will, uh, because the, the FCU, flexor carpi ulnaris, um, it, it goes over this little bone here and it kind of tilts it forward. So I do find that people with FCU tendonitis um, have a um, have that symptom where they feel like they can adjust that pisiform. Um, all right, so the ECU is um, it's really easy to identify. You have um, pain to touch at the extensor carpi ulnaris insertion. You get a, 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 a you can see a visible subluxation. In in that those cases, what I do is I start with the weight bearing test, and the weight bearing test puts the ECU on slack. So if it is an only an ECU issue, which you see in baseball players that blow out the ECU, um, their weight bearing is pain free and normal, completely pain free and normal. If the issue is a TFCC primary and an ECU secondary. You'll see the weight bearing change on the, um, with the tape on the wrist, and then you just got to give it some time. There's a lot more to talk about on that. Okay, 
So that's the first thing we look for is, of course, a TFCC. The second thing we look for is the um, location and details of the symptoms to see if the FCU, flexor corpi ulnaris, is, is um, involved. The ECU is another thing that we see um, that causes ulnar-sided wrist pain um, that can be related to a TFCC or, or injured all on its own. The next one, which unfortunately I've been seeing a lot of, is a hamate fracture. Hamate fractures, um, usually the hamate <coughs> is right here in the wrist. It's here. And if you, uh, usually hamate fractures involve a fall or a bat, um, a, a bat or a club, uh, any, any thing that sits on here and actually pushes down and fractures this little bone here. And um, that one has a um, pain with weight bearing. And so it becomes a little confusing to, um, uh, you know, not all pain with weight bearing is a TFCC. The difference with this one, they also have a subtle change in weight bearing with the wrist switch on. But more importantly, when you make a fisted grip and you take the tension off of the hamate, so you can imagine these being the tendons of the pinky and the ring finger. Um, what happens is that 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 pushes up onto the hamate and causes pain. I do the first thing I do is I do a pull test, which in, entails taking the pinky and the ring finger, pulling it into your palm, supinating your hand, and trying to pull these out with with uh, force. So you hold this in, and try to pull this out. That does not hurt in TFCC tears. That does not hurt in flexor corpi ulnaris problems. That does not hurt in ECU problems. That is a unique test for the hamate. It's an important test. Then I measure, well, what's the stability of that hamate? So the weight-bearing test gives you a really good idea. And somebody that has a, an acute hamate fracture, they can't do that at all. Most of the time I see is a delayed um, delayed diagnosis. So they uh, come to me with ulnar side wrist pain, but actually they have a hamate fracture. And what we do is the pull test first, weight bearing on a flat hand, and then a weight bearing on a gripped hand. And what will happen is the weight bearing in a gripped position still hurts, but it's a lot higher. And the, um, the extent of the hamate fracture is directly related to how much weight they can bear through their wrist in a gripped position. So um, um, identifying the, uh, a fracture to the hamate um, is a special x-ray that has to be done. It's called a carpal tunnel view. And what you do is they just take a, a, a picture of the hamate, the wrist, in this view. And you can see the hamate here. And um, so if, if the injury is within two months, um, you uh, four four weeks. It's it, you know they you, you you're trying to see if there's a crack here, and the crack is going to try to heal, and so the longer you wait to do that carpal tunnel view X-ray, the harder it is going to be to see that that fracture because it's trying to heal. So, but I usually start try to get a, um, a referral for go back to the doctor and get a carpal tunnel view, and then obviously an MRI or a CT scan. A CT scan is 1,500 X-rays. They don't like to do them. It's better, way better to get this um, done early. But you also have a really good objective measurement of how it's healing over the course of time. So um, the weight bearing test is really helpful in um, identifying how bad the hamate fracture uh, is. If it's below 45 pounds, it, it, it takes a more urgent um, uh, uh, thorough analysis. You need an x-ray and you also could do an MRI or a CT scan because you don't want uh, to go too long if this is displaced. If there's a crack in here that, that, that may be not stable, you want to treat that quickly. Most of the time for us, we, uh, we don't see it as a displaced uh, fracture and so we can manage it with conservative tools. All right. Next thing is, um, so the things that we usually see for ulnar side wrist pain are, of course, the TFCC, flexor carpi ulnaris tendonitis, extensor carpi ulnaris tendonitis, 
palmate fracture. Next is ulnar abutment syndrome. And um, the ulnar abutment syndrome is, um, is where the, uh, the, ul the ulna pushes up against the lunate here. All right, this little bone here. So this is the scaphoid. And we do see scaphoid lunate issues. We'll talk about that in a minute. Not as often as we do these other ones, but this is the lunate. And what happens is that the ulna will hit up against this bone. Now, why does the ulna hit up against that bone? And why does that happen? Um, there's a lot of discussion about a positive ulnar variance, which is a uh, you're just born with a longer ulna. In severe cases, you get Madelung's deformity, where your ulna is truly longer than the radius. That's rare. I've only seen three cases of, of Madelung's, and that's a bilateral problem, not a unilateral problem. But really, when you talk to these cases and you listen to how it evolves and you look at their studies, what you find, or what I find, is that what happens first is you have a TFCC tear that goes untreated. The bones spread apart. Now the ulna is not lining up to the, to the lunate. And as you use your wrist, particularly with a lot of weight bearing and a lot of load, it just starts to hit up against that uh, lunate. It just, it's not, the wrist, the radius and the ulna are not aligned. And so if that progresses and the, the lunate bone is now inflamed, that is, you don't want it to get to that place because then it becomes a big issue. So the, the, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to squeeze the radius and the ulna together and hold it there so that that abutment doesn't happen anymore. And you can see the change in the weight bearing tolerance. You see it really clearly. Now, it, 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 you got to give that lunate some time to rest, um, and and that's longer. It becomes a longer issue. So not only do you have to heal the TFCC, but now the lunate needs to rest, and the lunate is now inflamed, and so you've got to recognize that you're going to have some scaphoid and lunate movement concerns. You're going to have scarring in that lunate. The lunate's just irritated. So it just, you don't want that, your wrist to get to that place because it's hard to unwind it. And, um, you know, you watch it a lot. You, you can use the weight bearing test to watch it, but the lunate and the scaphoid, they are responsible for stability with dynamic wrist flexion and extension. The TFCC is not responsible for that. The TFCC is responsible for stability with rotation and weight bearing, whereas the lunate is this. So people that have ulnar abutment have problems with weight bearing, rotational load, but also flexion and extension. And you get kind of a clunk when you go into flexion extension, and the severity of it is really how, meant, how much weight can you do, grab with your wrist and go into flexion extension without a clunk. So um, ulnar abutment is something, um, unfortunately, I see too much of. Next is a systemic inflammation that affects the ulnar side of the wrist. And unfortunately, I'm seeing a lot more of this. And um, I'm not sure why, but I'm just seeing a lot more of this. Um, so these cases, they present with ulnar side of wrist pain kind of out of the blue. They don't have any fall, any injury, any change in their activity. They just, all of a sudden, their ulnar side of the wrist start lighting up. These cases, um, in, its, in an acute inflammatory reaction, they have a significant loss of stability in the wrist. So you can see this in rheumatoid arthritis flares. You can see this in Lyme, um, people who have STDs people that have uh, Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome, people that have um, um, a systemic inflammatory reaction going on in their body. And uh, it's really tricky, hard to find the, the clues of what that is. Usually I do full, uh, ask for a full blood test, a full CBC with inflammatory markers. And um, I do like a tick panel, 
and a stool test and not everybody has access to that but it's really helpful for people if you fall into that category where it just kind of came out of nowhere it is affecting your every waking minute it hurts at night as well as in the morning um, you get a significant loss of weight bearing tolerance with a small but not significant, uh, not as significant a change in weight bearing tolerance, but a loss of weight bearing tolerance. Um, it's dynamic, it goes really bad and then gets better. Um, I, I recommend a full body um, systemic assessment. Um, um, your primary care doc can do that, um, online physicians can order that. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that getting those tests done uh, really saves a lot of time because when treated, the symptoms go away. Um, sometimes the treatments are hard and long, but it's worth your time. Um, and, you know, I see the change in weight bearing, um, w w particularly in rheumatoid arthritis, where the weight bearing is low, the risk widget improves it but it doesn't have significant changes over the course of time. So every week you're not seeing this eight pound improvement in your weight bearing tolerance. And then they go on tr treatment, um, methotrexate for example, and then all of a sudden their weight bearing tolerance goes back to normal. So really good to understand if there's an underlying issue, identify it, treat it, and then use the weight bearing test to confirm your progress and that you've 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 adequately treated it and it's making the progress on its own all right next thing that I see is um, thank you Sarah is um, ulnar nerve problems ah. I'm gonna tap in here before we go into the ulnar nerve let's see if she joins in Hi. Uh, hi. Hi, Sarah. Hey, how are you? Very nice to meet you. You too. Is there any questions I can answer? Yes. I've been Go having right problems. I've been having problems with, with one of my wrists. Tell me about it. Um it's like I've been having pins and needles a lot in my hand. How did it start? Um, I think I fell on it. When? I don't remember. That's the thing. Um, how long has it been going on? Um, I think two or three months now. Okay. And, and when do you feel it the most? In the morning and evening? Is there a particular activity that you do that, that aggravates um, it? No. Is it all the time? Yes. Um, and how does it affect your function? What can you do and what can't you do? I can't do a lot. I can't really play in gym class as much as I used to. Is it, is it a sh have, have you done the weight-bearing test? No. Okay. All right, so this, this is a really good case to talk about the ulna nerve. And um, so, okay, so the first thing, Sarah, would be good to you, for you to do is to do the weight-bearing test. And it's, okay. it's on the website. There's a video. All you need is a non-digital scale. Okay. And get some tape. Do you, do you have some non-elastic tape? No. Okay, so... If you could, it's not expensive to get some non-elastic tape and take okay. a look, make sure it's non-elastic and that you have two pieces. And okay. what you're going to do is you're going to wrap your wrist just like the wrist widget, okay. uh, you know, and, and first check your weight bearing without it and then check your okay. weight bearing with it. And then okay. send us a little note. We have a questionnaire on our website that you can complete okay. and send, send us your case. And what, what that, that is, is it tells us how it affects you. We've been logging this cases for a long time, and this is super yeah. valuable. It's more of a comprehensive assessment tool. So questions on does mm -hmm. it affect, affect your wrist motion? So fill out that form 
with okay. your weight bearing numbers and your symptoms. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll contact you and make sure that you have all the information you need. And then if, okay. if something doesn't fit, um, we'll try to squeeze you in on our schedule, take a closer look at it. Okay. All right. Um, but Thanks. pay attention just for a few. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to go over in just a little bit on the nerve. And so maybe this okay. little discussion on the nerve will help you kind of understand what's going on. Okay. All right. So, all right, Sarah, I'm going to answer Nick. Um, can you circle back to the question when I get a chance? Yes, Nick, I'm going to go back um, directly below the pinky knuckle. Directly below the pinky number. Nick, can you describe more where below the pinky knuckle you're um, feeling pain? That's nowhere near the ECU, so we want to figure out where that is, um, what's going on. Okay, so let's go over the last one, which is the ulnar nerve. And um, so the ulnar nerve is, um, it, it supplies the pinky and the ring finger and half of the long mm -hmm. finger with um, uh, energy to, to, to move the muscles and um, provide, sen provide sensation to the hand. Um, it, it, there's a lot of ways that the ulnar nerve can become inflamed. And the first is usually systemic. It's a, um, it, it is a secondary consequence of something going on in the body in general. Um, you can get it with iron deficiencies. You can get it with chronic inflammatory processes. Usually it's a first mm -hmm. trigger that the body is losing. It doesn't have enough fuel. Um, so the, the second way that it can get uh, irritated is if it's stretched too hard, too fast. And if you're um, injured at the neck and then the shoulder and uh, under the clavicle, shoulder, elbow at the cubital tunnel, and then, of course, a hamate fracture here can cause nerve um, symptoms as well. So um, th th um, there's a website that uh, we have online. That I did a discussion about ulnar nerves and how to put it on stretch. What I usually do is I check your weight bearing tolerance first to make sure I rule out a hammock fracture or any sort of loss of stability in the wrist. Mm -hmm. If it's just an ulnar nerve problem, you don't lose that much stability and there's no change with the weight bearing tolerance. You'll have nerve symptoms after it and both nerves will be, uh, both wrists will be low if it's a systemic uh, a nerve issue, but if it's a specific nerve issue, um, the weight it doesn't. It's not going to affect weight bearing tolerance unless you have a hamate fracture, um, unless you have a, a cubital tunnel at the uh, problem at the elbow. <clears throat> Clavicle fractures can cause that impingement at the neck. I mean, there's there's a lot of places and a lot of reasons why the nerve can suddenly not behave well. We take ulnar nerve problems very seriously. We don't want to let ulnar nerve problems progress because they are responsible for um, conducting energy for the muscles, and you will lose a significant amount of muscle if the ulnar nerve goes pinched and irritated for long periods of time. So we ulnar nerve pro problems, median and radial nerve problems, we, we kind of move, a, we have to move a lot faster because you can see people who don't take care of, they kind of ignore it, and they get a really significant progressive loss of muscle strength. And those kind of have to be addressed early and aggressively. You want to monitor the, those. You can get an EMG, which is nerve conduction test, um, mm -hmm. to see how your nerve is conducting energy. Um, but... Uh, people with ulnar nerve problems it's experience a loss of, of endurance and um, they have a very hard time with fine motor and certain types of pinch but grip goes down quickly and um, we see loss of intrinsic strength which means this the muscles you, you get this wasting in the hand 
sometimes it happens in three months. Sometimes it takes three years. So a nerve conduction test is a good thing to see kind of how your ulnar nerve is conducting and, and tell you how quickly you have to move on treating it. So ulnar nerves are probably the, the hardest, I think, to manage. Um, they're complicated. They have uh, significant consequences. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's just helpful if you have ulnar nerve symptoms to do a couple of things. One is to get some blood work done first. Two is to try to get an EMG. Three is to monitor your grip strength. And the way I, uh, there's sophisticated ways to monitor your grip strength that require a dynamometer and a pinch strength, but a lot of people don't have access to that. And so I use this as a grip strength test. <laughs> it's a, a way for you at home to measure how much grip you can endure and, um, and to watch that over the course of time. So, um, Sarah, I hope that helps. Let's see if I can circle back to the um, dorsal. Above and below, I'm a guitar player with chronic TDC. Okay, uh, I guess your name is Nick. Nick, um, did, did you punch anything? Did you, do you box um, or have any sort of um, injury of that sort? Nick, can you answer that? All right. Um, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to, I, I just got a note that when you're on, the video quality goes down. and they, uh, So I'm not sure how to, uh, let's see here, um, to take you out of the live room. Is it possible for you to turn your video off, Sarah, and then just listen in? I can try. Okay, Nick. All right. Dorsal here or here, Nick? Um, I'm going gonna, gonna to add you in uh, and see if I can take a closer look at this. Let's see, Nick. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Nick. Started gradually lifting weights regularly. Okay. All right. Mm, Nick, all right. Hi, Nick. Hi there. Hi. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about what, what's going on. So, yeah, it started um, kind of out of the blue, but I, I had mm -hmm. had a, a fall in 2013 and dealt with a similar issue. And then went, I got an injection at that time, went years without any problem, was returned to weightlifting and playing guitar. And then suddenly um, started to have, uh, you know, ulnar sided wrist pain and um, it got worse. The, the doctor put me in a, in a cast for a month. Um, but yeah, the, the pain is on the, here, I guess I'll show you. It's on, let me see that. It's, like here on this side and you get the paint here and sometimes into here and my okay, MRI is chronic tear um, with ECU tendonitis, tendonitis and tendinosis okay so what's your weight bearing now um it's still low but I think it's from the the uh the cast I lost a lot of weight yeah. bearing dollars from the the cast and I didn't check yeah. it before when was your cast on um, How long ago? About a month ago. Okay. All right. So, um, it, 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 uh, did this start at the same time? Yes. Yes. That was one of yeah. the, the most distant symptoms. And when if, if I would push like this, like squeeze it almost, I get the pain in the mm -hmm. knuckle. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's common. Um, the cast casts are hard to do in the hand. Um, Especially for a month. And if it was a long cast and it didn't, it wasn't short here. So, so the pain was there before, the knuckle pain was there before I was ever in the cast. Ah, okay. Now that's important. Okay. Can you describe how that started, when that started? It was, it, 
started around the same time as the the ECU pain. Um, okay. And especially when I would make, go, make this, so I do this a lot as a guitar player, kind of putting, be, bending this, and yeah. I would get the pain in here. So that was the first symptom I had, and then eventually it became more textbook uh, ECU. Yeah. Okay, okay. So th this little joint here and the big toe, do you, do you feel any pain in your big toe in the morning? Hmm. I did have some on and off. I don't have any right now. Okay. Um, when was the last for blood work? Um, relatively recently, but months before that. But I don't know how comprehensive it was. All right. Well, it'd be really good to understand. Inflammation. Mm hmm be really good to look at a CDC and see if you're a you know, couple of trick couple of things the um, sudden onset without any injury mm -hmm. is the first clue yeah and then the involvement of this joint and maybe the big toe so be good to have that test done just to see. Get, just go get a general physical and get a, a comprehensive CBC and see if you have any inflammatory markers. Are you hearing me or is there a delay? No, I'm hearing you. Okay. Get your weight-bearing numbers too because the weight-bearing numbers are going to tell me if your wrist is unstable how much stability it, the, the taping or the wrist widget brings back. So that'll it's tell okay. me kind of what's going in your wrist. Okay. But, but for ECU, that, it's not common to have, you know, pain and here. No, no, okay. no. no. There was widespread tendonitis in, in all of the, the tendons on that side of the wrist. I, uh, yeah, yeah. So there's something systemically I suggest I, 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 I would guess and trying to figure that out is super important okay thank you, you. where tell me I'm not done with you yet take take there's a lot more to this there's there's a lot more detail to this okay go to the website fill out that form and let's get some information. Let's follow you a little bit. So what I, what I want to know is, uh, you know, first of all, you have to address this too. If, if this joint is really important for guitar playing. Mm -hmm. And it would be really nice to have, get you some stability back in that joint so that you can play and kind of calm this down. It'd be really good to understand what your weight bearing tolerance is now, even if it's not a good time, even though it's not ideal and you know you were affected by the cast. It'd be really no good to know what your stability is now and then try to get your stability to a functional level so that you, you're not making things worse. You're, you're helping your body heal while you do the blood test. So, um, send us that information and we'll monitor you and kind of keep an eye on how your symptoms are evolving and give you some tools so you can get functioning normally um, as all this other information is coming in. Yeah, I don't see, uh, the ECU doesn't cause this. It just okay. doesn't. N yeah. Now that I think back, the first pain I had was right on the insertion of the ECU to the, to the metacarpal. Mm -hmm. Well, so but did you have any sort of um, rotational pain before that that you just kind of thought and ignored? Like uh, supinating? Uh-huh. Yeah. So like, you know, when you carry something with the palm up. Not that I remember. All I remember is uh, that around that time I was typing a lot, eight hours to 10 hours a day. Okay. So... Typing is, is a lot of ulnar deviation and wrist extension. And playing the, the guitar is a lot of supination and ulnar deviation. Mm -hmm. um, the supination and ulnar deviation makes the ECU bark if your TFCC is not happy. So you got to put this puzzle together. 
we've got to put this puzzle together and really um, see clearly the sequence of events as it started and then where you are now. So you, um, you know, only you know what you were doing and the evolution of your symptoms and how it affected guitar versus your typing versus your load ability and how it presented and what was done and how you respond to that really help us understand which one was first. Was it an acute inflammatory event, which then caused the TFCC to get a little weak, which then put a strain on the ECU because your guitar playing kind of stresses that out, reflection, ulnar deviation, typing. And, and then did the, this stuff come after that? Was this stuff kind of simultaneous? All of these little details matter. They matter. Where do you live? Uh, I, I'm in uh, South Florida. Okay. Do you have um, um, any sort of stomach problems, sneezing, um, fatigue, um, irritable bowel sim- symptoms? No. Any, do you, okay. Do you have any um, just changes or feelings in your general health during the course of this time? No. All right. Um, changes in your diet? No. Changes no in changes your exercise? That I could. Uh, no exercising regularly. I was lifting a lot of weights at the time, too. Okay. All right. How old are you? Uh, 30. Okay. All right. Let's get some numbers. Let's, let's get some more information. Let's get some weight-bearing numbers, and um, let's, let's look a little bit closer at this case. Yeah. All right. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Yeah, hang in there. Okay, hang thanks. There. Happy Sunday. You, too. All right, so I've gone over 10 minutes, but I'm going to do these um, uh, every couple of weeks. Um, try to add some content as we go along with these unique cases and um, continue our mission to help you guys all figure out um, how to um, heal your own wrists and uh, do what you need to do to get better. Um, I thank you guys all for um, participating and for sending in your data. And um, I think all of us together, we can um, really make a difference on um, our health of our wrists and uh, heal our injuries together. Um, Have a great weekend and we'll see you the next time. Bye, everybody.